Excellent. Now we have some well, welcome. going. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have to like do my dancing while I do your intro? Yeah, I think I think you should. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Joe from the Access Agile um, space. I'm one of the ambassadors here to welcome you all to this amazing session from Mark Kilby. Um, just before we jump in and I introduce him, uh, as you will have heard probably a few times by now, we have a code of conduct. It's basically um, harassment is, is a no-no. Uh, and if you are being harassed or if you are aware of any harassment, please do let us know. There's an email on the website where you can get in contact with us and we will um, do our best to sort it as quickly as we can. Uh, if somebody is being harassing on, on an event, please ask them to leave. And if they don't, we do have permission to in completely kill the session if need be. So please don't do anything. I know you guys won't though. I mean, this is a chilled out cool session. You know what I mean? Just in case. Okay, so you don't wanna see me. That's for sure. Um, you're here to see the amazing and the wonderful Mark Kilby. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. Um, and I'm okay with being harassed. I get harassed often, but it, to stick with the code of conduct, don't do that. So you can harass me after the session. So, uh, hopefully everyone has seen the slides. Joe, give me a thumbs up. If Are you still seeing the slides? No. Okay, let's work on that. I should have kept the chill music going. All right. So uh, if you do not know me, uh, you'll hopefully see the book on the slide. So I, I co-wrote the, the book From Chaos to Successful Distributed Agile Teams with the wonderful Johanna Rothman. Uh, we wrote this before the pandemic, <laughs> to, just so to be clear on that. Um, and it all still applies. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is kind of some things I've learned after writing the book and some things that, that happened last year that might help answer that question. Are we going remote, hybrid, or something else? But I'm, I'm curious, and I see some people are already in chat, which is lovely. What do you hope to get out of this session? Because we have a small group and I would I'd love to make this conversational. So what are you hoping to get out of the session? Just give me something in, in chat really quick or come on audio, either one's fine. Uh, good morning, everyone. In my case, I do work with several distributors teams. So probably maybe some new strategies on how to better engage with them and, and increase our productivity from, mm -hmm. from the some of the challenges that we've been facing so far. Okay. Distributed just during the pandemic? Um, no, okay. no. Distributed, uh, distributed ever since their inception. Okay. Okay. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll actually hit some, some material fairly soon though. That should apply, George. Cool. Anybody else or feel free to share in chat. Hi. Um, I think my situation is similar. I've been working with distributed and remote teams for close to 20, I, at least 20 years, maybe longer if I count some of the ones that, yeah, they were still geographically distributed even going back to the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think it's a topic whose time has come. The, I'm concerned the companies are still saying remote until when there's really no reason for us to be in the office. If I'm in the office, my whole team is somewhere else anyway, most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're not all in the same place. So it's how do we make this work? Not is it going to happen, but how do we make it work? And the tools have gotten better during the pandemic, but there's always room for improvement. Yeah, yeah, okay, definitely. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely, touch on some of that. So uh, a little bit more context. When Johanna and I wrote this book, uh, like like Sheila, uh, we both had 20 plus years with remote teams. So, uh, and in the book, if you haven't had a chance to read it or if you haven't been on my website and I'll, I'll share that at the end, uh, I, I typically talk about three 
basic types of distributed teams. Uh, one is the satellite team. You've got most of the people in an office, which we're kind of getting to, to this with the hybrid situation, but you've still got one or two outside the office. Uh, the cluster situation where you have parts of the team in different places, and then what I call the, the nebula team, because I like to be spacey. So, uh, the, it, but the nebula team, it's everybody's remote. And, and many of us have been forced into that nebula situation, or I know some are hybrid. I, I know during the, during the pandemic, some were rotating even during the height of pa pandemic based on the type of work, especially if you had hardware uh, or some of the things that required you to be in uh, a common space, not necessarily an office, but in a common space. Okay, well, good. That gives me a little more context so I know where to kind of emphasize certain things. But if you think of other questions, please uh, come on audio, uh, drop it in the chat. I certainly welcome the conversation because this is an ongoing conversation. Okay, so as I hear the, the plans about how are we getting back to the office, what are the policies, things like this, it reminds me of a game we have here in the U.S. called Pin the Tail on the Donkey. It's a, it's a kid's game where you wear a blindfold and there's an image of a, uh, like a picture of a donkey on a, on a wall and you have a tack and a paper tail and you're supposed to, you're supposed to try to get as close as you can to pinning the tail on the donkey. However, when you listen to the media or you hear the different opinions even in your own organization it seems a little bit more like this and there's a lot of people with blindfolds on running around with pins uh trying to pin down what the future of the organization is going to be is it going to be remote is it going to be hybrid and and so what i hope to do today is to give you a little bit more information to help you in those conversations that I'm sure you're having with your colleagues. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what you might have missed in 2020. Uh, some people have seen some of this, some, some have not. I tend to monitor quite a bit uh, about remote work to stay in tune with that. Welcome those who just who just came in. If you have questions, just go ahead and put it in chat. Um, also, as we move forward, what to watch out for for the rest of this year and into next year. And I'm already seeing some of these ripples, these ripple effects happen. And then what options do you have moving forward? What can you do for yourself, for your teams, for your your work group, if you if you manage or are involved or coach several teams. And you're probably going, oh my gosh, there's more that I missed about remote work. Uh, yes, but it, it's not traumatic, so hang on. But what I think many people miss about remote work and those of us who've been doing it for a while, and I'd be curious of some of your comments of those who've been doing it, is the importance of choice in remote work. So choice of when to work, where to work, how to work. So when you're working remote, you don't have to worry about your, uh, you know, how, how you've got your desk arranged. You don't have to worry about the, the music being too loud. You know? so, so it's it's really, you didn't have that choice in 2020. Uh, many people were forced into it. And it was kind of like this foggy road. It's like, we're trying to stay on the road. We think we, we know where we need to go, but you didn't have that choice. So one of the things that, I, that was, uh, came out early on from uh, Matt Mullenweg, um, if you don't know Matt, you might know his company, Automatic. And if you don't know Automatic, you probably know their key product, which is WordPress. So Matt is the person uh, who started Automatic and started WordPress. And uh, they have been running fully remote since inception. Uh, I, actually, I think there was a short period of time where they started in one office. And they said, nope, not working. 
we're going remote. And this was years ago. And so he sketched out these levels of autonomy for remote. And the, the first three are probably what you're familiar with. So level zero is you've got to be in the office. And these were our definitely our essential workers. Not, not all. Some were kind of forced to be in the office when maybe they didn't have to be. Level one is it not a remote friendly environment, but it could be remote. So those organizations that struggled the first few weeks or months uh, of the pandemic to, to keep things running, this is probably where they were. Level two was, okay, we've, we've got some infrastructure, we've got a way to do this, uh, but we're gonna replicate what we do in the office now. So everything is synchronous. We have the same meetings all the time. And uh, because we're not, we were learning Zoom or, or learning how to do everything in uh, WebEx or Microsoft Teams or, or these tools were trying to catch up with us in some cases and quickly updating, uh, you would get a meeting finished. And so you'd go to, you'd schedule another meeting to catch up. And it became a full day of online meetings. So what, what Matt said was really for those fully remote teams, it's, there's other levels to this. So you'll, you'll also know that I have a Menti code up here. Uh, so feel free to go into Menti and vote where you think your team or your organization was as I explained some of these others. So level three was you're already remote. The, the organization has, has been designed and planned to be remote. The team works remote. You've got the infrastructure. People know how to use the tools. Uh, and not everything happens in a meeting. There, there's coordination that happens asynchronously online through some other mechanism. Uh, maybe it's, a, it's some sort of task board. Uh, or Kanban board that's online that signals. Maybe it's in a pull request if you're familiar with GitHub or Git in general. And so some things can happen asynchronously. Matt also describes level four as going fully asynchronous. And this is where Automatic is right now. So much of what they do is asynchronous and decisions are often made asynchronously uh, many things happen asynchronously, but there are still meetings. But when those meetings happen, it's a signal that this is a critical conversation. You need to come prepared. So there's usually something uh, you, you have to read in advance or something. So when they have a meeting, it, is, it signals this is critical. But everything else is really done asynchronously. And because of that, that means we trust the individuals to do what they say they're going to do. There's no monitoring. There's no, there's, there's no checking in. We, we are hiring professionals. Level five is sort of the, the ultimate level. You're completely lo location free and you can, your remote team works as well as any in office team. Now, Matt, in his, in his uh, podcast where he originally put this, and he's, he, uh, he also had it in this blog post here, he talks about this is, this is something that you, you cannot hold forever. There's always going to be some sort of challenges. But I have, I have seen teams that have bounced between four and five. Okay, So I, I see a few people have voted, but I'm going to give you another second or two to go into Menti if you want to add, where were you? during this, were you at level two, three, four in 2020? It's at the top of the screen, but I'll go ahead and type it there in chat. And I'll say more about that gray bar later. Because the key here, is those companies that were remote well before the pandemic, they climbed this hill. This, it took them time to climb this hill where a lot of people that were forced to go remote in 2020 
did not have that opportunity to climb. All right, so we have a we have a few votes. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so so one person was saying, yeah, I had to be in the office. Uh, some were definitely in the the Zoom meetings all day. I'm sorry, uh, and then we had had some, and we we heard some questions earlier. Um, let's just say the organization, Sheila. So Sheila was asking, are we saying me, the team, or management? Let's just say the organization. Yeah, during during COVID. And COVID. So, yeah. So, so there was a mix of experiences, as we, as you can see here. And this this is a informal survey that when I when I work with a new team, I'll even ask this at the team level, at the individual level, because maybe you pulled in people that are brand new, and you might say, "Were you working remote?" before the pandemic or is this all new for you because that's they're also climbing this learning curve yeah okay got it all right thank you for those responses uh, let me go ahead and move on in the interest of time so another thing that you probably didn't come across uh because i find not many people know dr lejeski's work but this is the third book she's published. And the second edition of this book came out in 2020, early 2020. And uh, if, if you want to read more about this, I would say this is the book to get because her, her, uh, her first two books get very deep and very academic quickly. Uh, this one has a nice summary of the research, uh, but it's done by uh, Karen Lejeski, Dr. Karen Lejeski and Dr. Richard Riley. You'll typically hear, if you search on YouTube, you'll see usually Dr. Lejeski talking about this. But the book summarizes 14 years of research across 55 countries, over 36 industries, and includes everyone in the organization. So this is well before the pandemic and well before some of the technologies we had. But they, as they've continued to conduct this research, uh, they're, they're finding that technology has actually little effect. So they came up with this concept or this measure of virtual distance. And this is how they define it, a felt sense of distance that grows without us realizing it, it sometimes when we rely on mediated communication. So, you know, it's not just Zoom, but it's these funny little things that we always have in our hands anytime we're communicating through these different devices. And before the pandemic, they even had this principle, the, the prime virtual, virtual distance principle, that everyone is a virtual worker, therefore virtual distance impacts everyone. So that means we all have been virtual workers in some way, shape, or form already. So what does this mean? What is this virtual distance? So here are, are three components of it. So this is how they, they measure the virtual distance. And the first one here is the physical distance, which is usually the first thing people think about. The geographic distance, the, te the time zone or temporal distance, or the organizational distance? Where are you in the organization? Are you in a different group versus somebody else? The operational distance is how, how well is communication handle, handled through these devices? Uh, do we have good infrastructure? Do people understand how to use the technology? So that's the readiness component. And another part is uh, what they refer to as multi-load, which is not just how how busy you are on a particular project, but how much multitasking, because this goes far beyond agile. So, so the amount that you're multi-loaded with, and this goes into task switching, essentially, it's a measure of task switching. The last one is affinity distance. So how culturally close are we? Do we have the same understanding? So before we started the recording, Somebody came on 
eating their lunch, which I don't have a problem with, but in some cultures that can be a huge problem. And you, and if you're not aware of those cultural differences, that can prov- that can produce some distance. There's also relationship distance. How well do I get along with Joe or Craig uh, or uh, Sheila? Do I work well with them? And also, how interdependent on them? If I'm if I'm a agile practitioner, I'm probably very dependent on my team. I, I I'm probably working with them. I might even be caring with them or doing some sort of mob type of work where all of us are working together on one thing. So of those three definitions, I'm gonna ask you to go back into Menti and let me know which of those distances were the biggest for you, say from right now through 2020, was it? Was it really the fiscal distance? Was it the operational distance, how we communicated and, and how we organized the work? Or was it the affinity distance? Was it our, our, our cultural differences, our relationship or our, our work interdependence? So which of those distances impacted you the most? I'm sorry, it's menti.com, not smenti. Trying to get some votes in there. I don't want to be biased, but I do want to be aware of our time. Give a little bit more time. Yeah, so as... um, Riley and Lejeski have captured this information. They're looking at these three factors, and there's actually sub factors, which is the these elements I just described here. All right, so let's look at what we have. Okay, so uh, it looks like we have a tie between the operational distance and affinity distance, and very few feel that physical distance is an impact. Why do you think that is? I'm going to share in chat or come on audio. Why do, you, why do you think that the physical distance is not that big of a deal? Um, hi. Hi, Miguel. I think uh, for me, physical distance is not um, a big deal because of the technology. Okay. What I what I mean is that you can communicate. Uh, I think really well without being in person, at least at my work. I think that's why. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I've seen a couple of limited examples of the physical distance being a problem because of technology. Because the organization wasn't completely set up for remote. Therefore, the lack of technology meant that the distance was an issue. I mean, I heard about one person's laptop that broke, and then he had to physically go into the office to get it fixed. And the office was a long way away, and there was limited cover. So there's a lot of time wasted taking a uh, laptop in that otherwise would have just been fixed in the office mm-hmm. it was working in. But th- these are kind of quite limited examples. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks for that, Craig. And thanks, uh, Miguel. So this is what, and I kind of left a hint there on the screen for you. This is what their results show. Physical distance is typically, and and remember they covered many countries, many industries, physical distance, even over the last 14 years has been a very small issue. Think about where the technology was 14 years ago. We didn't have Zoom. We didn't have uh, all, all the, the communication technologies we, we have now. Uh, and even then, it wasn't that big of a, a difference. The operational distance, yes. How, how we're communicating, how ready we are to communicate uh, in this way was, was more of an issue. And actually, it was twice as, twice as much of an impact as the physical. And the affinity distance was the greatest. So it really, 
the relationship, the cultural differences and the interdependence, which for those of us who launch teams, who uh, maintain teams, manage teams, coach teams, this is what we're dealing with anyway. So it's really understanding how do we how do we maintain the health of that team? I see some comments here. Um, yeah, so Ruth, very good. Yeah, very good point. The physical distance in this in this case allowed for safety from sickness, COVID, and eliminated the fear as a distraction to productivity. Yeah, it's a big, good point. Yeah, and physical distance, uh, Craig says, physical distance can also impact on time zones and if they overlap much. Yeah. So uh, a little bit more about this, this piece here. Um, with the physical distance, we've already talked about a lot of this. There's short-term fixes and there's, we've, we've all at this point figured out some sort of heuristics or uh, rules of thumb, so to speak, on how we can adapt to this, um, some are good, some are not so great, like time shifting. If you, if you shift your hours too much on a regular basis, you impact your sleep, which impacts your productivity. Uh, operational distance, uh, and Craig actually had a very good example of this, was the laptop broken. So is the laptop broken? Is the VPN down? Um, if you use Facebook the other day, yeah, Facebook for business was probably not working for your team. Uh, so those are the kind of issues. Zoom has gone down. So yes, it does happen. It's rare, but it, it has gone down. So that's that problem with the operational distance, but it's short-term fixes. It's really where you're going to get the most impact is focusing on those team dynamics, even as a remote team. So let's talk a little bit more about how you can do that. So uh, a group of folks out of Australia uh, started talking about their framework, their experience uh, about remote. And what I like about this is it can be used in, in many different ways. So it is modular. It can be used with other frameworks too. So these, the, and I'm, I'm actually trying to get them away from the word framework because it's really a set of patterns. So it's patterns that can be applied in different remote situations, but it does emphasize the communication, the connection, the cadence of those communications as well. So what Johanna and I talked about in our book uh, very much aligns with what these folks have come up with. It's you have to adapt your, your remote way of working to that affinity that you're trying to build within your organization. So we talk about that quite a bit in our book. And that's, that's why I'm a, a big fan of the patterns here at remote, uh, remote AF. Just as an example, everything is usually captured as a canvas and you don't necessarily have to use the whole canvas. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing today. Uh, but just getting understanding of how you're aligning on some of the constraints of the team. Or how are you designing the flow of the work? So maybe you're doing something like value stream mapping, or you might have some other way. But it's, do you understand how the work is, is going to flow rather than just throw the team into it? There's some other things that you can you can bring into this as, as well to make sure everyone understands the context we're in. And these are not new concepts, but it just has some remote spin on it. So if you've done charters, if you've done um, agile lifts, liftoffs, it's a very similar idea to some of these, these frameworks and segments of frameworks have some considerations for remote and hybrid remote. So questions that the team or the group needs to go through. All right, so I'm gonna pause there, see if there's any comments or questions before we get into our ripples. All right, not seeing any new ones, let me press on. So um, I wish I could say we were done, 
<laughs> with with this craziness. Uh, but I think we've got a ways to go, and and I think many of us realize that. Uh, the pandemic was the first ripple. It kind of dropped on us, and we didn't really know how the effects were going to ripple out. Um, I, and, I'll, and I'll add to this that the return to the office is going to be a similar ripple. Uh, many think it's going to fix things, but we've all been out of the office now, or most of us for a year and a half. So you're really, you really have another shift, another transformation that to go back in the office. Do we feel safe to go back in the office? And I'm sure we've all considered these questions, but we may not consider all the ripples that happen around these questions. And you may have seen headlines like this. Um, I think every, probably everyone has heard of the back and forth of Apple. Apple probably has the best, um, yeah, no problem, Ruth. Apple probably has the best offices uh, ever and still people don't wanna go back into the office. Um, I've seen different projections on who wants to be remote. I've seen 30, 35%, 51% by the end of this year. There, there's a significant question that's gonna hang there for probably the next three, four, five years, I think. And we've already seen the first great resignation and we're starting to see the tipping of another. So those are some big ripples that are, that are going out. And we were talking earlier before we got started about hybrid work policies. Now, the reason I have Capital One up here is if you go back and read their, their press release, they, and you read through the whole thing, it, I think it's well thought out. And at the end, it makes a very subtle statement. This is what we're doing for now. Now, some might say, mm, does that mean they're going back in the office? Or does that mean we got to think about it? And we, we're, we're realizing there's continuing ripples. We can't predict anything right now. My Knowing a few people at Cap One, I can, I can say they're probably leaning, leaning more toward the, we don't know what's going to happen. We're just saying, this is what we're doing for now. This is how we're letting our customers know. So going back to this picture, Probably, well, actually from our, our survey, we saw a good number that were here. There were some that were still down here, had to go into the office. Some folks were already here. And as I said before, this, this is a hill that you, you intentionally climb. You're not forced to climb it. So many of the companies that have been fully remote uh, have, have thoughtfully climbed this hill, not been shoved up it by the pandemic. So I, I think what we see here, and this is not part of Matt's original picture, but I see sort of a wall here. Some people are gonna bounce off this wall and not be able to progress further. Uh, some, some will, but I think those that, that don't progress past level two are probably gonna slide back down. Those that start asking the questions about, and uh, Sheila, you were asking these questions early on, do we need to be remote? Or do we need to be in the office? Uh, does everyone need to be in the office? So it's really thinking about what is the best way for us to work, not doing things the way we always have. And I see Craig had a couple of comments here. Uh, yeah, I realized the commute wasn't worth it, exactly. I was talking to a fellow yesterday, they used to do three hours of commuting. He goes, I don't miss it, I never wanna go back. Um, make re remote fantastic, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Craig's also saying, use the money saved on office space by having more lavish get-togethers a few times a year and better perks. Absolutely. When it's, when it's safe for us to do that, um, I have done this in fully remote organizations is you bring everyone together and that's that event. It's not just for planning, but it's really for building that affinity. That's really the purpose of those. Let's bring everyone to one location. Let's make this a real event. It's for amplifying that affinity.
and there's other dimensions. I'm, I'm not gonna go too far into this in the interest of time, uh, but we're probably gonna have some people that want to experiment with being a digital nomad. So how mobile can you be during the day or during the week? So that's something else we're probably going to see uh, in, in the coming uh, months and years. Another one is hours of overlap, which I have quite a bit on my website, but I'll just kind of give you a, a taste of it here because uh, one of the folks was talking about this early on. What do I do for my different team members? So note that you've got some people here in this example in the Eastern time zone, you've got some uh, in Europe, both uh, Western Europe and Central Europe, but they're also coming in at different times because they have families, they have preferences. And so some might come in very early their time. So Mike here comes in at 7 a.m. He's an early bird. Um, Ian delays his time a little bit, one, to avoid the, the commute time, but also to align a little bit better with his team. So you can see that there's, there's different preferences as to when they take lunch, when they come in, when they leave. And this leaves them with only two hours in the day where they have 100% overlap, where they can actually have meetings together. But that doesn't mean they can't collaborate. There's other times where most of the team is together and they can collaborate together. Here's another example. So tell me one thing you noticed that's different about this example. I'll give you a hint, look at the time zones. So they're all Eastern time zone. They're all in the same time zone. And they do not have 100% overlap throughout the day because people have preferences as to when they wanna work. So even when we were all in the office together, there was never a time we were all 100% together. So this team adjusted so they could have at least four hours of overlap, but uh, is that enough? It might be for this team, for them to have meetings, for them to collaborate in different ways. It depends on the team is my point. So what can you do? What are your options with all this? How do you navigate this maze of, of different ways of working remotely? So as I mentioned before, keep in mind this move back to the office is a transformation. So you have to iterate and experiment. Uh, so as, as Cap1 said in the press release, this is what we're doing for now. We're not sure yet. Uh, there are others that had some interesting examples there as well, which I'll get to here in a second. But you wanna focus on that affinity and autonomy. Do they have a strong connection, but do they also have some autonomy choosing how they work best? And I would suggest having the teams look at this. So discussing their hours of overlap together, how do we need to adjust so we have sufficient hours of overlap for those times we need to meet, those times we need to collaborate, and when do we need some focus time? And reuse some of the patterns that are out there already. I talked about, um, things such as uh, remote agile framework, but I strongly suggest taking a look at what Dropbox has done. Dropbox has done, they, they were discussing going remote before the pandemic. And then when things started happening, they said, you know what, now's the time to experiment. While we're forced out of the office, let's, let's run some experiments. Let's ask our people, what do they need? So they actually had their VP of user exper experience run surveys, run uh, various types of events with the staff saying, okay, what do you need to work well? And so they redesigned their organization with that in mind. And I already talked about some of the patterns at Remote AF. So I wanna see uh, what questions we have, uh, but if you want more information, a lot of those references to the Dropbox, I, there's several articles there. Uh, if you if you want to see the Cap One press release or some of the other things I mentioned, I have those all listed at that site. And uh, if you want to keep up with the latest, just 
you you're welcome to sign up for my newsletter. But I'm curious, what other questions do you have? So not question per se, Mark, but uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, what, what has been most useful for me is this latest bit, the Capital One, the Dropbox. Uh, obviously I was aware of what uh, Automatic was doing before and so on. Uh, some of my clients are very comfortable with remoteness. Uh, some uh, got into it kicking and screaming. In, uh, a year and a half ago, and and so yeah. on. So it's uh, it's now the time to be asking the question of, you know, where do we move? Uh, what do we plan for forward? And of course, nobody really knows. But uh, there is opportunity to say, what do we want, or what culture do we want, and what do we want to shape, or what experiments do we want to run? So um, hearing what some of these other companies are doing has been most useful. So thank you so much. I mean, you, you touched on the, the Apple issue and people complaining about being forced back to the work. Um, what, on, on the flip side of that, the companies that have gone and embraced 100% remote as an option, are they finding it easier to recruit? Or is there positive benefits about suddenly having a workforce that's not necessarily going to be near the office, but it's more distributed? Are they, are they you know, kind of prospering because of that? Um. <laughs> They, they, they are definitely taking advantage of that situation. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll say this, one of the, one of the things I, I did even before the pandemic was to track the number of job boards that focused on remote work. So there were probably eight or nine, I would say good job boards that had remote work offerings, mostly technology, but but not always. Uh, that number has probably tripled or quadrupled now. Some are, are, are regional in that they're, they're trying to help certain regions understand what it means to be remote. So there's one in particular that comes to mind called uh, Grow Remote. Uh, I think it's growremote.ie because it's, it's based out of Ireland, but I think they have some other um, locations now, they do a wonderful job of not only uh, providing the job board, but also providing training for, for others. So where, where you can certainly pay for getting training on being more proficient remotely, they offer it as part of their, their service to the, the Irish uh, tech community. Um, there's something else I was going to say on that on that respect. Uh, I will I will say this: uh, the big turning point was on for LinkedIn, at least here in the U.S., when one of the search options became remote. So if you are job the, searching, the job boards remote, are based around 1990s technology, in which you have to yeah. specify a location. Of remote's not there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they still kind of fudge it a little bit. Uh, but there, but there, but Link, LinkedIn has gradually made changes over the last few months, so you can do searches for remote positions. Uh, Indeed, and I just came across this the other day because I was curious. Indeed, not only has their own app, but they have a remote app, at least on the iPhone. I don't have an Android device that says uh, I think it's like work from home app, and it's in, it's still Indeed, but it's just for remote positions. So yeah, there I. I, th I think those companies that are prepared to work remotely, uh, those, are, those are the ones that are going to really find some excellent candidates. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that point. Although I find um, that there's an interesting aspect to that is that first of all, you can now recruit from anywhere. So therefore you've got a wider talent pool to draw from. It's a clear advantage. However, if you were a regional company before, and uh, you paid local rates, you're now finding that you're competing for candidates and to retain people that are able to offer city rates. Yes. And so what it's tending to say is that, well, some companies are 
going down the route of if you move away, we'll reduce your salary to the local rate. And some local companies are saying we're now having to up the salary to the city rate in order to attract people. So it's yeah. it's having a very uh, mixed effect on the uh, salary market. It may yeah. it might encourage a bit of a leveling off, but we're in a bit of a, a change of flux at the minute with it going in both directions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I I think for a lot of it, it will get down to supply and demand. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? All right, we will end it there. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending. I'm gonna go ahead and shut off the recording now.